bra bits, sweatshirt, Garrison Keillor's News from Lake Wobegon cassette tapes, the Lake Wobegon souvenir t-shirt, plus many other related items. If you're not on our mailing list and would like to receive the catalog, call now, toll free, 1-800-445-4000. Or write to PHC Catalog, Minnesota Public Radio, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101. That toll-free number again for your free PHC catalog is 1-800-445-4000. This is the American Public Radio Network. Broadcasts of a Prairie Home Companion on WISU-FM are made possible in part by Mahoning Bank, your family financial center with 26 locations, serving Mahoning Valley residents since 1868. You're listening to WISU-FM Youngstown, Classical 88.5. And a reminder tonight that a tornado watch is in effect for much of northeastern Ohio until 9 p.m. Welcome back now to the second half of our live broadcast of A Prairie Home Companion. This portion of our show brought to you by your friends in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, a little town that time forgot that the decades cannot improve, where they have closed the road into town this evening because there are enough people there they don't need any more, especially the kind that have been arriving in the last couple of hours. <laughs> Big celebration up in Lake Wobegon today, sponsored as our show is, by the Sidetrack Tap, by Ralph's Pretty Good Grocery, and by the Chatterbox Cafe in Lake Wobegon. Today is May the 17th, 
soot into my Norwegian Independence Day and the fishing opener, the opening of the fishing season in Minnesota. Two great days in the Minnesota calendar falling on the same date. It is amazing, an amazing confluence of, um, of uh, powers. Uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, almost like two planets moving, moving across each other's paths, changing our lives in ways that you and I can barely, can barely realize now. A mysterious, mysterious day in Minnesota. Fishing opener, certain to my, on the same date. Boats that went out early this morning on Lake Wobegon, moving out in the darkness and the mist shortly after midnight, steam coming up off the waters. As they moved slowly out, they could see great wooden ships out there on Lake Wobegon <laughs> with great high carved wooden prows and old men standing at the rail, old men with white beards, leaning down over the waters and saying, Kom, kom fisker, kom, jeg er din ven, kom nu, kom. <laughs> Leroy Larson going to step up here and play a little tune here. The sun came up and they were gone, Leroy. It's an amazing thing. Oh, sound like the Vikings. Well, they found, they found a stone on the shore up there with strange writing on it. Mm -hmm. But never mind. I, we'll talk about it another time. Leroy Larson and his band be playing tonight uh, for certain to my at the Bell Ray Ballroom. Yes. Right. So if you can't make it to the Bell Ray, here's a little tune you can dance to right here. Okay. I'd like to send this out to my in-laws down in Davenport, Iowa. They're celebrating tonight, and they're not even Norwegian. <laughs> uh, Helgi Lamo starting out here. This is Elg Anders. It's a Norwegian walking tune, or ganglot. Thank you. Here's some time.
We're going to uh, play a tune now by the great Norwegian violinist Ole Bull, who uh, traveled uh, a great deal in the United States back in the mid-19th century. In fact, he bought about 120,000 acres out in Pennsylvania in 1852, and then shortly after buying it, he found out that he paid a dollar an acre for it, and he found out that uh, the man he bought it from did not own the land. So, uh, and then Ole Bull had a little trouble locating this man after that time. But uh, his intention was to set up a new Norway there in Pennsylvania with the capital being Oleana. Well, this is um, Ole Bull's uh, most popular uh, tune, Seterianten Sundog, inspired by a Norwegian poet and folklorist, Jürgen Mo. It's... Uh, a sather is an area high in the mountains where they take the livestock in the winter time or <laughs> summertime, and um, the cattle graze up there during the summertime, and someone has to watch them take care of the cattle, and they usually live in, in the old days anyway, live in little huts up there, sometimes stone huts. Yeah, that's a sather, I guess. And um, uh, Sundog is Sunday, and it's a song about uh, this young girl. Oftentimes the young women would go up there and herd the, the, the livestock, and this is... Uh, young girl up in the Sather on a Sunday. Thank you for that. What a sweet, mysterious tune. Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown. Sitting to my the opening of fishing season today on this on this very day. I wonder what they're doing now. I'm not sure that I want to know. Having a good time, I hope. It's been very rainy this last week. Got an awful lot of rain, which was good for all the lawns and the gardens of town. Not really for the farmers, but for the people in town it was. Everything just turned so green this last week. Such a powerful shade of green all through the town. Walk down the alleys where there are alleys and along the streets and sidewalks where there are sidewalks. And just look at the grass, look at the bushes and the trees. The green just comes, comes out at you with a light of its own. You look at it for just a moment, and then you see green for the rest of the day. It turns your eyes green, everything that you look at. Your kids are green when you look at them. 
Your food is green on the plate in front of you. Look at your thumb. Your thumb is green. But it's not really. It was, it was the rain that accomplished all of this. Though some of the kids in Lake Wabagon did turn a little green uh, this last weekend in Lake Wabagon, it was the, the uh, weekend of the annual junior-senior prom a week ago Friday night, and uh, you know how that goes. It was an elegant evening. Uh, Caribbean holiday was the theme of the prom. <laughs> Hundreds of palm fronds hanging from the rafters of the gym and a great illuminated moon up over the scoreboard. Uh, an illuminated moon and, uh, and a little plexiglass lagoon out in, out in the middle of the floor and dim lights and sweet Latin music and young people dressed to the teeth, dancing close and visions of elegance led, as they often do, to illusions of omnipotence. <laughs> During and later, out in the parking lot, when the bottle was passed, uh, or the fruit jars in some cases, and uh, some of the boys had uh, more than they had ever had before in their lives, which was none whatsoever. <laughs> And they learned a lesson about vodka uh, a week ago Friday night that I'm sure they'll remember for the rest of their lives. That uh, it may be tasteless going down when you have it with uh, orange juice. You may not notice it going down, but on the return trip, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a memorable sensation. There were a lot of young people wandering around in the streets uh, early Saturday morning. A lot of sailors uh, battling heavy seas in Lake Wobegon <laughs> about 2, 3 in the morning. I'll tell you, if there had been preachers up and around that early, they could have converted those young people uh, to just about anything they chose. Convert them to Lutheranism, convert them to Masonry, Methodism, Rosicrucianism, or convert them to Japanese Yen. Those people were ready to be picked, <laughs> those young people. But they just went to bed and, and uh, slept until sometime Saturday night and probably forgot the most important part of the experience. Anyway, we got a lot of rain, so whatever they left behind, it was all washed away by <laughs> Sunday and everything was fresh and green this, uh, this week. It was not so good for the farmers, because they had gotten as much rain as they could use now. It was far too much rain and all at the wrong time. So that for some of them, with things going as, as badly as they have been going, and now the weather against them, it was just almost more than they could stand. I'm thinking of Roger Headland, who had 80 acres left to plant, and then it started to rain, and it wouldn't quit, and it was the worst. 80 acres, the 80 acres with a good clay undersoil and held the water and it just turned into a pond out there to the west of his house. Just awful. He just sat all week and looked out the window at it and just about drove his wife crazy and, and their kids as well. He was just absolutely impossible to live with all this week jumping up and looking out the window and sitting down and jumping up and walking around until finally, on Friday morning, Cindy said to him over the breakfast table, she said, let's just get out of here. Let's just leave. She said, three years in a row now, your brother has invited you to come up to Grand Rapids for the fishing opener. And you've never been able to go. And let's go tonight. Just get in the car and leave. And his girls were at the table, Kathy and Martha, and said, yeah, why don't you? It'd be good for you. He said, leave. I don't have my planting done. I can't leave. What sort of person do you think I am? She said, you're not going to be able to plant. You can see that. You can't plant for at least three, four days if it does stop raining. Let's just leave. Get in the car. Just leave it. You can't do anything about it. Well, he just couldn't do it. 
He just couldn't walk away from it until she said, and remember, Roger, she said, tomorrow is certain to mine. Well, maybe we could go, he thought. <laughs> the girl said, yes, why don't you go? You'd have a good time. Certain to mine, he thought. Well, maybe I will. He is a Norwegian who can't stand certain to mine. <laughs> Hates it every year. He has to try and please his mother. Mrs. Hadland now, she's pushing 85. You don't see her too often, but you see her on certain to mine. She's always out there. And to please her, Roger has to put on his little Norwegian knickers every year <laughs> and his little cap with the bells on it and the, and the funny shirt that nobody in their right minds would wear in Norway ever. He has to dress up like a fool and go around and dance down at the Sons of Canute Lodge. And uh, hopping around and and he can't stand it. And then she always says to him, his mother always says, Roger, sing Paul and his chickens. The only song that he knows in Norwegian, and he has to stand there like a fool and sing it. He thought, well, yes, maybe we will go. <laughs> so last night in the late afternoon, finally he got a few chores done and they got their stuff all packed up. And Kathy and Martha said, you don't worry about us. They said, you don't worry about us. You just go and have a good time. You just go and have fun, Dad. We'll take care of things. It was their tone of voice when they said that, that he thought of the next hundred or so miles heading up the highway towards Grand Rapids. It was the cheerful look on his daughter's faces, 16 and 17 years old, as they helped their parents out to the car and said, here, Dad, let me carry that for you. You just go have a good time and don't worry about us. Those words rang in his mind as he drove north and some way beyond Brainerd, Without a word to Cindy, he just put on the brakes and turned around and he headed back home. <laughs> what in the world, she said, what in the world? He said, don't ask me why. Don't ask me why, but I'm going to go back. She said, are you crazy? He said, as the father of two teenage girls, I'd be crazy not to be crazy. <laughs> he headed back. It took him over an hour. It was about 8.30 when he finally headed out from town towards the house. He noticed more traffic headed in that direction <laughs> than he'd seen before. Cars he'd never seen before. Strange cars, kind of low in the rear, filled with people heading out that way, west of town. And all of them turning in the driveway of his house. He cruised on past the driveway. She said... You're not going in then? He said, I'm not sure if it's something we really want to know about. <laughs> we may not know about it completely. He drove down the road a little ways and he stopped, pulled off the road. They sat, they looked out across those 80 acres, out towards the farmhouse sitting out there, the barn and the woods, the house blazing with light like a cruise ship out there <laughs> in the dark. It looked like a Caribbean cruise ship. And more and more cars coming up the gangplank and heading in to the farmyard. I don't know, he said. I don't know. She said, I think we ought to just turn around and head back to Grand Rapids. <laughs> I don't know, he said. I don't know what to do. Do you think we should go up there, he said. She said, no, I don't. She said, I think that when you trust people, you have to trust them and not go spying on them to make sure they do what you want them to do. You have to trust them. He said, I'm going up there. <laughs> I'm curious, he said, I'm going up there. He said, you want to come? She said, of course I want to come. So they took off their shoes and their socks, 
They rolled up their pant legs and they headed out across the 80 acres in the dark, walking slowly, squish, 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 through mud that come up to their ankles and sometimes deeper, heading towards the bright lights of home as the music got louder and louder, heading through the mud, through this swamp, towards home, headlights in the farmyard, and the music, voices screeching like people they'd never heard before, drums beating, bass guitar pounding, the music seemed to come up out of the ground. Roger said, my God, they're going to kill the chickens. And in fact, they come in past the chicken coop. Cindy looked in the window. The chickens did seem to be a little dazed by it all. They seemed to be disheartened. All the chickens inside the coop, they're all of them in their nests, but they seem to be upside down in their nests. So they couldn't see their heads except for the rooster pacing up and down by the door. Looked like he was about to call the cops. They looked out around the chicken coop, and the yard was full of kids. My God, Roger said, I didn't know there were many, this many teenagers in the county. Where do these kids come from? There must have been a hundred of them out there in the yard, moving around, milling around, a couple of kegs of beer by the back door, kids getting beer in plastic cups, passing them around, some kids smoking, wandering around, music pounding, pounding, coming out of the house. Where's the dog, he thought. Where's Oscar? <laughs> Their old watchdog, Oscar. My God, a car slowed down on the county road. That dog goes berserk. <laughs> now where was he? Spotted him, saw him. Little pile of fur there by the back door. Dog sleeping, its head down on his paws. Empty glass of beer by Oscar's head. <laughs> a dog drunk, what a disgrace. Roger stood there, just watched, just watched all these kids milling around, talking, milling, moving, kids looking around, kids talking to other kids, but looking over their shoulders to see if there was more fun over there. Kids moving, boys in groups, boys watching girls, girls in groups watching boys moving, watching each other. It reminded him a lot of parties that he'd remembered uh, from, from when he was a kid. He seemed to remember this, lighting up cigarettes. He remembered it, not exactly this way, but sort of. These kids lighting up cigarettes and passing them around. How generous, he thought. <laughs> kids smoking, lighting up. Then he saw his own daughter reach for a cigarette from someone's pack. Kathy, someone held out a pack of cigarettes to her. She reached for one. He thought, no, darling, don't. He took a couple steps out from the chicken coop. No, he thought, don't do that. Somebody held a light over towards his daughter's sweet lips. Oh, please don't, don't, don't do that, he thought. She inhaled, and a great cloud of smoke came out of the mouth of his sweet 16-year-old daughter. Oh, sweet love, don't do that, he thought. He stepped out. He just about to head over towards her. He wanted to, to uh, but he didn't really, you know. He didn't really. Cindy was right behind him. She was pushing him a little bit. She said, this is ridiculous. She said, how could they do this? She said, are you going to let them just get away with this? Roger thought, I don't know. Cindy said, aren't you going to go out there and stop this? He said, I don't know. You don't know, she said. No. Well, I don't know either, she said, but I thought you would know. <laughs> you're, you're the one who's always, who's always so strict. I don't know, he said. He said, you know, I'm kind of tired of being a father. It amazed him that he said that. But it seemed to be just exactly the way he felt. He said, come, let's just leave him. He didn't want to walk over there and have all those kids turn silent when they saw him. 
all those kids looking at the ground and him supposed to make some kind of speech. He didn't want to do that. He'd done it before. Had all the pleasure of it he's likely to get. <laughs> Calmly said, come on, let's go. She said, look at them. She said, they're walking on my flower beds. They're walking on my petunias. They're killing the plants. Let's go, he said. Let's just leave. And they turned and walked out behind the chicken coop and ducked down under the box elder trees and out beyond and past the wreck of the old corn planters sitting there in the high weeds. They walked past, tiptoeing in their bare feet, past the wreck of Grandpa Headland's old Model A sitting in the lilac bushes its doors still open. They walked out beyond the trees and started back slowly across the swamp towards their car as the music receded behind them. Kids milling around, kids laughing, music playing. They walked out. He said to her, he said, you know, it reminds me a lot of that party at the gravel pit. You remember that? She said, I don't remember that. Oh, he said, you do too. <laughs> That's where I met you, he said. <laughs> no, she said, you did not. We met at Luther League. <laughs> we met at the gravel pit, and it was just like that, he said. And then suddenly heard footsteps behind them, fast footsteps through the brush. He turned. He saw coming towards him, it was Oscar growling low in his throat, <laughs> snarling at him with teeth bared, the dog coming, barking at them. Oscar, he said, Oscar, easy. The dog stopped, but he still snarled at him. Roger said, Oscar, it's me. He took two steps towards the dog. The dog backed up, snarling, growling. How ridiculous. <laughs> to have to sneak up to your own home and not be able to go in, and then to be chased by your own dog. <laughs> and chase them, that dog did, all the way across the swamp. They walked faster and faster with that dog on their heels in the dark, snarling at and back and down the ditch and up into the car. How ridiculous, he thought. And how ridiculous, especially ridiculous, to get in the car and start it up and find that you had pulled a little farther off the road than you had intended. <laughs> and that when you started up and gunned it a little bit, the rear end slipped down in the ditch and you were stuck. How oh, ridiculous. So he had to make the long walk back to his house this time by the driveway. They got up to Grand Rapids about three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> got to his brother's house, got into bed, and as he lay in bed, Roger could remember everything that had happened. He saw it all over again, like in a movie, somebody else's life. Walking up the driveway to the house, Turning the corner, how quickly there was silence. They knew he was the dad. Someone switched off the tape. The music stopped. All of them stood around, clearing their throats. His daughter came out. She looked at him straight in the eye, without shame. She said, we decided to have a party. He liked that, the fact that she wasn't hangdog about it. She wasn't afraid of him. She just looked at him and said, we decided to have a party. Later, Martha said, I'm sorry if we upset you, but they weren't apologetic. Roger believes in that. He's never told them that, but he <laughs> believes in the old principle. It's better to apologize than to ask permission. He liked that.
He said, I need a push. Anybody got chains? Yeah, somebody had chains. He thought about how right after the Hawkstetter boy pulled him out of the ditch with his pickup truck, all the kids out there on the road standing around the dad who got stuck. He thought of how when he sat back down in the car, Roger felt a strange feeling in his rear end. No billfold. He had had it before. Must have dropped it when he was running from Oscar across the field. <laughs> Must be out there in the 80 acres somewhere out in the mud. Didn't think he'd go out and look for it right then. He said to Kathy, he said, do you have any money? She said, uh, how much do you need, Dad? He said, oh, if you had 40 or 50 dollars, it would sure be nice. She said loud to all her friends around, she said, my dad needs some money. Anybody got some money on him to lend to my dad? <laughs> they passed a hat. <laughs> they collected 52 dollars. It was pretty good. He thought about how his daughter Martha took him aside out there by the car and said, what were you doing parked by the side of the road? He said, none of your business. She said, you weren't. You weren't. He said, well, he said, I'm human too. She said, Dad, how sweet. He said, but, uh, but I meant that, uh, you mean you thought that, uh, you thought that your mother and I were, <laughs> that was sweet. <laughs> he remembered how driving up north towards Grand Rapids, for about an hour, he thought that his wife was asleep. And then, all of a sudden, out of the dark, her head in his lap, she said, I remember that party at the gravel pit. <laughs> you were there with your cousin, your cousin Jack. And Jack was talking to me, and he spilled beer on me. And you had a clean handkerchief, and you wiped it off. And I remember that. I remember thinking how kind and thoughtful you were, that I had beer all down my leg, and you were wiping it off and wiping it off. <laughs> and then there they were at his brother's house, in bed. His brother had gone to sleep long before, left the door unlocked, a note that said the rollaway is down in the basement. Help yourself to anything in the fridge. See you at six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Lying in bed in the dark, he thought once again, I'm getting tired of being a dad. Five daughters, he said, now he's down to the last two. Loves them dearly with all his heart, but he's had about enough. Had about enough of being in charge of things and being the authority on things. Watching that party in his yard, he thought, these kids are going to outlive me. They're going to run things someday. This world is going to continue without us. These children will go on long after we're left. So, don't need to be in charge of things anymore. Life is short. Let them go. And just learn to enjoy them. And just learn to love this sweet life. Thank you, God, for this good life, he thought. And forgive us if we do not love it enough. And thank you for all this rain. And thank you for the chance to go fishing in three hours. <laughs> which I thank you for now, because then I probably will not feel like it. 
And he kissed his wife on the back of her neck. And thinking of the gravel pit, and thinking of her right leg in white pedal pushers, <laughs> full of love, he fell asleep. That's the news from Lake Wobegon. All the women are strong. All the men are good looking. All the children are above average. Oh, Mr. Pop Wagner. Oh, no, I think what I did here was work myself in the vicinity of a love song. Oh, yeah. Let's, Let's sing that. one of those. Let's do that sweet old tune. It has all those verses to it. We could sing some of them and not sing the others. Okay. Or sing those and leave the others out. Whichever Sounds you good. wish. All right. You're the guitarist. You lead me on. I'm going away to leave you, love. I'm going away for a while. But I'll return to you somehow if I go 10,000 miles. The storms are on the ocean. The heaven may cease to be. This world may lose its motion, love, if I prove false to thee. Oh, have you seen those mournful doves flying from pine to pine? They're crying for their own true love, just like I long for mine. My own true love is far away, 10,000 miles from here. Actually, she's in the balcony. I think about her every day. My darling and my dear, the storms are on the ocean, the heavens may cease to be, this world may lose its motion, love, if I prove false to thee. Sing one for Thea here. Under the sun, the moon and stars, love is all that's true. Love has brought us safe this far, and love will take us through. My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. Let's sing one more in tune. The storms are on the ocean. The heavens may cease to be, this world may lose its motion, love, if I prove false to thee. One more chorus. The storms are on the ocean, the heavens may cease to be, this world may lose its motion, love, if I prove false to thee. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mr. Leroy Larson, come out here and play us another dance tune. For yeah, we're going to liven it up with a shot issue here. I learned from my uncle Lester Larson from Clearbrook, Minnesota, up north, way up north. We grew up in Sinclair Township, and we call this Sinclair Shottish.
Thank you, Leroy. I'll say hello to Virginia and Morton, Illinois, from Marion uh, Jerry, who are here, who say, can you hear us laughing? Hello to Mom in Sydney, Australia, from Peter and Deb. Brian and Ann, a note to you from Bob and Nora, who say, keep lock six open, we're on our way. For baby Sarah in Boulder, Colorado, get well soon, we love you. Grandpa and Grandma Johnson are here. To Wally Ray and Aunt Sandra, love from Robert. Hello to J Joe and Sue Haglock of Dover, Ohio, who now own the most expensive bathroom sink on 2nd Street. Happy 10th anniversary to Ann in Melbourne, Florida, Bud in Washington, D.C. May you always be this close, say Tom and Renee. Hello from the cool north to everyone in hot Memphis, especially Stephen, Michael, and John. Hello from Gail. Claudia and Stan Brandt say hi to Ralph, Jean, Cousin Margaret, and all our friends back in Chicago. And also to Susan, who's looking after our cats. Hello to Alex and Andy from my mom and Joe, who tried to think of something clever to say. Congratulations to Jay and Helen on your wedding day from Mike and Lou. And hello to Frank in Kensington, Maryland, from your wife, Suzanne, who is so glad that she saved you from Norwegian bachelorhood. Happy 90th birthday to mom from Bob and Kay Dumas. And hello to Susie in Fresno, California, from the two new Minnesotans who miss you, Angela and John. Love to beautiful daughter Sarah in Wauwatosa from Barry and Sue. Welcome back from Kuwait to Pam and Bill Kissick. And hello from Susan to her family in Pullman, Washington. And to all 11 Little Smiths on Crane Road in Ypsilanti, Michigan, a whole lot of love from your dad and your mom. Yes, sir. Mr. James DePogny, what a treat to have you and your whole bunch here. Thank do, you. Do us another little tune here before okay. we have to leave. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs>
That's Mr. James DePogny and his Chicago Jazz Band. That was Gene Rebeck on the bass. There, we want to thank Leroy Lars and the Minnesota Scandinavian Ensemble for joining us this evening. The Butch Thompson Trio, Pop Wagner, Peter Strushko. Thanks to Carol Hofstad, who sang the national anthem at the beginning of our show. James DePogny and his Chicago Jazz Band will be performing on June the 6th in Alpena, Michigan, and on June the 7th at Traverse City, just up the road. The Minnesota Scandinavian Ensemble at the Lake Superior Fiddle Contest in Duluth on June 28th. The Butch Thompson Trio tomorrow the 18th in Bemidji, and Butch is leaving on Friday for a two-week tour of Japan. Mr. Pop Wagner will be playing on Friday at the Full Moon Dance at the Ukrainian American Center in Minneapolis. Thanks to Governor Rudy Perpich for being with us this evening. Thanks for coming and bringing that handsome declaration, proclamation for Red Maddox. Stand up, Red Maddox. Show them the certificate. <laughs> Red Maddox Day today. Take those fish home with you, please. Take them as soon as possible. Our show was uh, directed, technical director was Scott Rivard with Preston Smith, Fred Wasser, Ernie Retzel, Dan Rolls, Bill Nicholson, and Brian Killian. Mr. Strushko, let's take him out on this old tune here. The great American poet Emily Dickinson wrote the words to this. So, Pete, let's sing it here. Let's not sing it here. Let's just say goodnight to the folks. And thank you for coming. That's our show for tonight. Good night, everybody. Good night. This is the American Public Radio Network.